All right, deep divers, buckle up because we are about to go deep, deep into One Piece, chapter 1127. And let me tell you, listener, after pouring over your notes, mm -hmm. um, wow, just wow. Yeah, you've definitely picked up on some seriously interesting stuff this time around. You're seeing things, and I don't mean observation Haleki style. This chapter, even for the wild, wacky world that IS One Piece, feels off. You know? Off is putting it mildly, right? And that's what we're diving into today. Why does this chapter feel like it's doing the thriller bark dance, Yeah. but on dry land? It's like looking at a perfectly mirrored reflection and then suddenly, bam, you notice something's reversed, out of place. It's those little things that Oda throws in that really get the gears turning. And you, listener, you caught those things. First up, Luffy's weapon. Now, we know this is a guy who practically breathes Hayaki, but his weapon in this chapter, it's doing a disappearing act worthy of a certain magician we know. Talk about a magic trick. One minute it's a sword, the next it's an axe, then poof, vanished into thin air like it never existed. And this is ODA we're talking about. The man who remembers what everyone wore to a party 300 chapters ago. Yeah. He doesn't just LAT weapons casually phase out of existence. Exactly. Especially not Luffy's weapon. It's like his other right hand, this vanishing act. It's screaming intentional, louder than a certain navigator in a storm. Speaking of things that are usually attached to Luffy, where in the Grand Line IS that straw hat? Now that is a detail you do not just gloss over. That hat is practically a character itself. I mean, remember Marineford? That hat went through the ringer, and yet... It survived. But here, gone. And it's not just the small stuff, either. You also pointed out something was up with the scale of things, mm. like Yi Gressel. It's this mythical tree, it's supposed to be huge, but... It looks like a bonsai next to some of these giants. Right. It's Elbaf, the land of giants. Everything should be supersized. And don't even get me started on the size of that Big Stein castle. Yeah, not exactly striking fear into the hearts of giants when it looks like they could step on it. And remember those giant bees buzzing around? They're the same size next to Nami as they are next to a giant. What's going on with that? Is Oda messing with forced perspective or something? It's like that weird feeling you get when you look at an Escher drawing. You know something's not quite right. And speaking of not quite right, there's that other detail you mentioned. Remember the monster trio attack in this chapter? You said it felt oddly familiar. It's practically identical to that combo they used way back in chapter 162. What was it you said? It's like Oda copy-pasted the panels. I did, didn't I? And you know, Oda doesn't repeat himself without a very good reason. And if memory serves, that chapter involved hallucinations, right? I, no, wait a minute. Okay. Are you saying, are we saying that what we're seeing in this chapter might not be what's really happening? It wouldn't be the first time Oda's played with our perception of reality. Okay. Oh, well, hold on, because my brain is trying to catch up with all these possibilities. So we've got these yeah. visual inconsistencies, a disappearing hat, a repeated attack, and you're throwing hallucinations into the mix. It's all starting to sound like one of those optical illusion puzzles. Exactly. The ones where you think you see one thing, but then it's something else entirely. And you know what? That brings us to one of your theories, listener. One that, I have to admit, has me seriously intrigued. Oh, yeah. This is where things get interesting. We're talking Loki levels of interesting. Yeah. As in Loki, the Norse god of mischief and trickery. Tell me, listener, have you cracked the One Piece code and discovered that it's secretly Norse mythology fan fiction? Hey, stranger things have happened, right? And knowing Oda, the line between myth and reality in One Piece is, well, it's more like a dotted line. It's like one of those connect the dots games where you're not quite sure what the picture's supposed to be until the very end. So you're saying Loki could be behind all this, messing with the fabric of reality. It's not impossible. Remember, the book, book fruit, trapping people in stories, making fiction real. What if there's another even more powerful fruit out there? Okay, I'm listening. A fruit that can warp perceptions, conjure illusions, maybe even rewrite reality itself? Fable, fable fruit, perhaps? Oh, that is good. And it would explain so M-U-A-C-H, the inconsistencies, the hallucinations. Heck, maybe even Luffy's missing hat is just a really elaborate magic trick. See, this uh, is why I love your theories. But even if it's not some mythical trickster god pulling the strings, you had another idea about this chapter that really got me thinking. Uh, you mean the flashback theory? That's the one. What if we're not seeing the Elvif of the present, but rather a glimpse into its past? That would certainly explain why Yggdrasil seems a tad underwhelming. Right. Like, maybe it's still just a sprout in this flashback, not the towering titan it's supposed to be? Oh, imagine the possibilities. We could see Elbaf in its glory days, meet legendary giants. 
maybe even. Catch a glimpse of this elusive sun god everyone keeps whispering about. Now that would be a revelation. Okay, but let's say, for argument's sake, that it's not a flashback. What about your theory that we're not looking at a smaller Yggdrasil, but rather a different part of the tree altogether? Ah, uh, yes. The Sky Realm theory. It's like that saying, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. Except in this case, it's the bigger they are, the higher they live. Wait, hold on. You're saying there's an entire civilization of giants living in a skywise city built on Yggdrasil? It wouldn't be the most outlandish thing we've seen in One Piece, right? And think about it. Asgard in Norse mythology, the realm of the gods, often depicted as being located at the very top of Yggdrasil. So maybe Elbeth is like an onion. <laughs> layers <laughs> upon layers of mystery, and we've only just peeled back the first one. And speaking of mysteries, what about these cryptic figures, the sun god and the ear god? Every time they're mentioned, it's with this reverence. Like, they're more than just myth. It's like stumbling upon some ancient text, and every page is a new riddle about giants and gods and who knows what else. And the best part is, we're not just making this stuff up. These hints, these legends, they're all coming straight from Oda himself. Exactly. It's like he's dropping these breadcrumbs, knowing that W.E., the deep dagger, is going to pick him up and start piecing the puzzle together. And speaking of breadcrumbs, what about our boy Frankie? We know he's got to be in tech heaven right now, just itching to get his hands on whatever Elbluff has to offer. Oh, Frankie's probably already found the giant equivalent of a dusty old workshop. You know, the one with the don't touch my tools sign written in runes? But seriously, what kind of tech do you think he'll find? Giant robots. Anti-gravity boots. Or maybe, knowing Oda, it'll be something completely unexpected. Right. Remember how much Oda loves to subvert expectations? What if it's not advanced tech at all, but something deceptively simple? Okay, now you've got me curious. Deceptively simple how? Well, you were the one who pointed out those weird scaling inconsistencies, right? What if those aren't just artistic choices, but actual clues to a lost art form? A way of manipulating size and perspective that the giants use to build their civilization. Whoa. And Frankie, with his love of all things big and bold, he'd be the perfect one to rediscover that kind of knowledge. Exactly. He could combine his own engineering genius with these ancient techniques and create something truly mind-blowing. All right, now I'm officially on the edge of my seat. But as excited as I am for Frankie's inevitable eureka moment, let's not forget the Straw Hats aren't on a sightseeing tour here. They've got a target on their backs, bigger than ever after that whole egghead incident. So, the question on everyone's mind, are we going to see some new bounties? Oh, without a doubt. I mean, they've got the world government, the marines, probably even Blackbeard himself watching their every move. New bounties are a given. The question is, when will Oda drop that bombshell? You know Oda? He's a master of timing. He'll reveal them at the perfect moment for maximum impact. Just imagine those wanted posters plastered all over the new world. And you know, it's interesting, revealing the new bounties after Elbaf, it's almost like a symbolic shift. Like the Straw Hats are stepping out of the shadows of even the giants and becoming legends in their own right. Deep divers, you know we say it every time, but you truly outdid yourselves with this one. Your observations, your theories, they never cease to amaze us. It's like you have your own version of Conqueror's Haki, only instead of knocking people out, you're waking them up. Waking them up to the incredible depth and detail woven into every single panel of One Piece. It's true, and it just goes to show whether you're a seasoned pirate or just setting sail on the Grand Line for the first time, there's always something new to discover in the world of One Piece. So until next time, keep those theories flowing, keep those eyes peeled for clues, and most importantly, keep on diving deep. See ya.